In June of 2018, Massachusetts woman Julia Enright arranged to meet up with her ex-boyfriend in a treehouse near her home in Ashburnham. It was a spot where Enright and Brandon Chicklis had often had intercourse while they were dated in high school. On the day in question, however, 21-year-old Enright pulled out a knife and stabbed Chicklis several times, killing him. The young woman subsequently enlisted the help of her then-current boyfriend, John Lind, to cover up the stabbing. Enright and Lind wrapped the victim's body in tarp and duct tape before dumping it about 12 miles north in the town of Ringe, New Hampshire. Chickless' body was ultimately found a few weeks later. The police interviewed Enright, who confirmed her encounter with Chickless in the treehouse on the day he died. Her version of the events that led to the stabbing painted her as a victim in the situation, rather than an aggressor. She claimed that though she'd initially planned to have intercourse with Chickless, she changed her mind. He forced himself on her, so she purportedly used the knife in self-defense. However, the fact that she chose to hide Chickless' body rather than contact the authorities Casted doubt as to her supposedly innocent intentions, Enright was charged with second-degree murder and the matter was brought to trial in November of 2022. The prosecution unveiled journal entries Enright had written about her insatiable curiosity to kill a person. They also brought up the young woman's work as a professional dominatrix, as well as her pastime of building bone art out of deceased animals to portray her alleged fascination with violence and death. The court also heard about text messages Enright had sent to her boyfriend shortly before the killing in which she asked, do you think we could add bubbles to a bloodbath? Although Enright maintained her self-defense claims, she was ultimately found guilty. In the spring of 2023, she was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years that same month. Lind was indicted on charges of conveying a human body, accessory after the fact to murder, misleading a grand jury and perjury. Number 5. Jacob Sullivan and Sarah Packer In 2007, Sarah and David Packer, a seemingly ordinary couple from eastern Pennsylvania, adopted a girl named Grace along with Grace's younger brother. The Packers cared for dozens of foster children before David was incarcerated for allegedly abusing Grace and a teenage foster daughter. In the aftermath, Sarah was fired from her job as a Northampton County adoption supervisor and was prohibited from taking in any other foster children. In spite of ample evidence of abuse and mistreatment, child welfare officials chose not to remove Grace from the Packer household at that time. In 2016, Sarah had a new partner, a man in his mid-40s named Jacob Sullivan. The latter was said to have received gratification from the thoughts of assault and murder. He and Sarah decided to act out a shared violent fantasy in July of that year and chose to involve Grace, whom Sarah would later describe as a non-entity that she wanted out of her life. They brought the teen to a sweltering attic in a home just outside Philadelphia, where they administered what they thought would be a lethal dose of medicine. The couple then bound Grace's hands and feet and stuffed the ball in her mouth. Subsequently, Sullivan assaulted the defenseless girl while her adopted mother watched. When he was done, they left Grace to die in the suffocatingly hot attic. She managed to escape some of her restraints before Sullivan returned 12 hours later and fatally strangled her. In the months that followed, the couple concealed the victim's body in cat litter. Eventually, they dismembered it and hid the remains in a remote area where hunters would stumble upon it. In October, both Sullivan and Sarah were arrested and hit with a number of severe criminal charges including first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse. Sullivan pleaded guilty in February of 2019 and after 12 hours of deliberations, a jury sentenced him to death. While announcing the punishment, a Bucks County judge told the man, you have no soul, before adding, I have never said that to another human being in my life and I hope to not say it again. The following day, Sarah was sentenced to life plus an additional 52 to 102 years in state prison. In the spring of 2020, Sullivan passed away of natural causes while awaiting execution at SCI Phoenix in Montgomery County. Number 4. Kyle John Vandermolen Missouri man Kyle John Vandermolen invited several people over for a pool party at his home in St. Charles a northwestern suburb of St. Louis. On August the 29th of 2021, while a female guest was using the bathroom, she reportedly noticed a covert video surveillance camera that was pointed directly at the toilet. 
The woman removed the device's memory card and informed her husband of the unnerving discovery. The couple subsequently brought the memory card to their home where they determined that it contained 11 clips that had been recorded during the party at Van der Molen's house. The videos featured multiple guests including the woman and her husband with their genitals clearly visible. One of the female guests captured by the hidden camera had brought her young son into the bathroom with her. A group of concerned neighbors returned to Van der Molen's home the following day and confronted him. The man confessed and profusely apologized for the voyeurism, which he claimed was a product of impulses brought on by his excessive drinking. Van der Molen was taken into police custody on September the 1st after officers allegedly found him en route to purchase moving boxes. He was charged with one count of felony invasion of privacy. Number 3. Sharon Lopatka Marilyn woman Sharon Lopatka left her husband an alarming note on the morning of October 13th of 1996. She informed him that she was traveling to Georgia to meet up with friends but said she had no plans to return home. The note also read, If my body is never retrieved, don't worry, know that I'm at peace. Later that night, Lopatka arrived in Charlotte, North Carolina on an Amtrak train. She was picked up by Robert Bobby Frederick Glass, a computer analyst whom she'd met online. The pair drove to Glass's rural mobile home and Lepatka was never heard from again. Her husband contacted the police after finding the note she left him. Investigators subsequently uncovered six weeks of email conversations between Lopatka and Glass in which they exchanged raw, violent and disturbing messages about the former's fantasy of being tortured by an intimate partner. In their email correspondence, Lopatka had explicitly requested that Glass torture her to death. Law enforcement staked out Glass's mobile home for several days but saw no sign of Lopatka. They ultimately obtained a search warrant for the residence and recovered several of the woman's items from inside. Human body parts later determined to be Lopatka's were reportedly found buried beneath a mound of soil roughly 75 feet from the home. Glass was consequently arrested on first-degree murder charges and held without bond. The man later admitted to fulfilling Lopatka's twisted fantasy about being tortured but claimed that her death had been accidental. The chief state medical examiner of North Carolina affirmed Glass's claims, stating that Lopatka had died of accidental strangulation. Glass pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter for which he received a state prison sentence of 36 to 53 months. He faced an additional 27 months in federal prison for charges of second-degree minor exploitation, stemming from explicit magazines found in his possession. In February of 2002, Glass died of a heart attack in his prison cell. The case maintained notability in the years that followed because it was described as the first instance of a murder suspect being arrested primarily due to evidence found in emails. Number 2. Lisa Schuler. On May the 6th of 2013, 49-year-old Charles Pierce was gunned down at a home in New Albany, Indiana. The homeowner who pulled the trigger, identified as Lisa Schuler, initially told 911 dispatchers that Pierce was an intruder whom she'd shot in self-defense of herself and her home. As the police began investigating the matter, however, it became clear that Shula's story was a lie. Following her 911 call, the woman had deleted over 200 text messages from both her phone and Pierce's phone. When law enforcement confronted her with their discovery, she admitted to fabricating her home invasion claims. In reality, Shula had invited Pierce to her home that day, just as she'd done on at least one other occasion, in order for the pair to engage in intimate relations. They were reportedly acting out a violent role-playing fantasy about Pierce abusing Shula. At some point, the latter grabbed a 45 caliber handgun from a holster on her belt and unloaded the clip into Pierce at point-blank range. In court, prosecutors contended that Shula committed the murder because the victim was in possession of compromising explicit photographs of her, which she feared would eventually reach her estranged husband. Although the woman apologized for her actions after pleading guilty, Pierce's elderly mother didn't think she sounded sincere and expressed her belief that a life sentence should be handed down. Ultimately, Shula was sentenced to 45 years in prison. We have our release about when plotting goes wrong, lined up for you right after number one. Stay tuned if you'd like to watch some more They Will Kill You Today. Number one, Graham Coots. 
The burn-in partially decomposed body of British woman Jane Longhurst was found in the woods in West Sussex on April the 19th of 2003, about a month earlier. 31-year-old Longhurst, a special needs teacher and gifted musician, had gone missing without a trace. Ten days after her remains were discovered, the police had a man in custody. Brighton resident Graham Coots, at the time in his mid-thirties, was arrested on suspicion of murdering Longhurst. Around that time, Coots had been romantically involved with Longhurst's best friend and reportedly spent ample time with the victim prior to her death. While in custody, the man claimed that Longhurst had died while the pair engaged in consensual, erotic asphyxiation. However, investigators found no evidence to support Coots's premise. During the ensuing murder trial, which commenced in early 2004, it was revealed that Coots had harbored dark fantasies about necks and strangulation since he was a teenager. He often engaged in breath control play with consenting partners, including a woman who testified that he'd confided in her about having murderous impulses, which he feared he wouldn't be able to control. The man expressed similar concerns about himself to a psychiatrist he met with during the early 1990s. The court also heard that Coots was addicted to explicit online videos that featured elements of violence. A day before Longhurst was killed, he allegedly downloaded images of dead and strangled women to help satiate his twisted appetite. After committing the murder, Coots initially hid the victim's body in a shed, then moved it to an empty apartment. He finally moved it to a storage center, which he reportedly visited nine times over a three-week period. In the end, Coots was convicted of murder and sentenced to life. Two years later, the verdict was reversed on appeal, but he was ultimately found guilty again during a retrial. His life term was reinstated, and he was ordered to serve a minimum of 26 years before being eligible for early release. Number 7. Nicholas Rosker Two deputy U.S. Marshals spotted a suspicious man outside the Maryland residence of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh in the early morning hours of June the 8th of 2022, when the individual in question later identified as 26-year-old Nicholas Rosker noticed the federal agents. He began walking down the block. Rosker then called 911, reportedly telling the emergency dispatcher that he was armed and intended to murder Judge Kavanaugh. Members of the Montgomery County Police Department were sent to the area, where they took Rosker into custody. Upon searching the man's backpack, the officers reportedly found a tactical police vest, a tactical knife, pepper spray, zip ties, a pistol, and two magazines of ammunition. They also discovered a collection of burglary tools that included a hammer and a crowbar. Rosker was subsequently interviewed by the FBI, whereupon his previous statements were confirmed, and it was determined that he had in fact planned to assassinate the Republican jurist. According to subsequent reports, the man was upset over the leaked Supreme Court draft opinion that indicated the landmark court decision Roe v. Wade was expected to be overturned. Rosker also believed that Judge Kavanaugh would work to loosen gun control laws in the wake of the mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas, that resulted in the death of 21 people. He allegedly told the police that he plotted to murder Kavanaugh in order to give his life purpose. As was detailed in a Department of Justice press release, Rosker faced a federal indictment on one count of attempting to murder a justice of the United States. As of the latest updates on the case, the man's initial court appearance hadn't yet been scheduled. Number 6. Tara Lambert Former model Tara Lambert from Circleville, Ohio, was accused of trying to hire a hitman to murder her husband's ex-wife in July of 2015. The assassin whose services she was enlisting, however, was actually an undercover police officer. He recorded their interactions and the $125 down payment they'd agreed upon in the parking lot of a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Lambert was subsequently arrested and charged with one count of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. In January of 2016, she was found guilty and sentenced to seven years in prison, but would only end up serving 16 months at the Ohio Reformatory for Women before the 4th District Court of Appeals overturned her conviction on a technicality. The charges were levied against Lambert again in February of 2018, but she pleaded not guilty, triggering a retrial. Then in July, she was convicted for a second time and consequently sentenced to five years in prison with credit for the 16 months she'd already served. Number 5. Thomas Bart Whitaker 
On December the 10th of 2003, Texas man Thomas Bart Whitaker told his family that he'd taken the last of his college exams and would thus be graduating from Sam Houston State University in Huntsville. The 24-year-old subsequently met up with family members for a celebratory dinner at a restaurant in Stafford. Upon returning home later that night, they were met by an armed burglar wearing a black ski mask who gunned down Whitaker's brother and mother. The young man's father sustained a non-fatal gunshot wound to the shoulder. After the sound of gunfire had prompted him to run inside the home, Whitaker was the last to enter the residence, at which point he was shot in the left arm by the gunman, who then fled out the back door. Paramedics were called to the scene but were unable to save Whitaker's brother, who was pronounced dead within minutes of being shot. Shortly thereafter, his mother passed away as well, while she was being airlifted to Memorial Hermann Hospital. In June of the following year, Whitaker traveled to Mexico, where he found work in a Saralvo furniture shop under the assumed name Rudy Rios. He remained there for over a year, but the investigation into the deadly home invasion eventually led Texas authorities to issue a capital murder warrant against him. It emerged that Whitaker had enlisted an individual named Chris Brashear to kill his family. He had reportedly instructed the hitman to fire the non-life-threatening shot into his arm in order to divert the attention of law enforcement away from him as a potential suspect. During the case's court proceedings, the prosecution argued that Whitaker had devised the murder plot in pursuit of monetary gain as he'd reportedly stood to inherit approximately one and a half million dollars after the death of his parents and brother. He was ultimately convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death. However, after he'd spent several years on death row, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment without parole. The decision reportedly came only 40 minutes before Whitaker was scheduled to be executed. Number four. Anna Bella Dukes. Police in Albuquerque, New Mexico arrested Anna Bella Dukes in January of 2022 for her alleged role in a botched kidnapping plot that resulted in the death of 24-year-old Elias Otero. Prior to the incident, which had occurred on February the 11th of 2021, Dukes and her accomplices had targeted the man's younger brother on social media, intending to abduct and hold him for ransom. The victim is lured into meeting up with 18-year-old Jukes via Snapchat. On the day of their scheduled rendezvous, he was ambushed by Jukes and her three accomplices, one of whom was identified as Adrian Avila. Police records detailed how the suspects had dragged the man from his vehicle, demanding cash and jewelry at gunpoint. They subsequently drove to the victim's house and ordered him to tell his brother, Elias, to bring them money as well as a gun. The older Otero emerged from the home with a firearm in hand, and threatened to shoot his brother's kidnappers, at which point Avila opened fire, killing him instantly. Both Avila and Dukes were charged with an open count of murder, kidnapping, two counts of armed robbery, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy. Number three, Amy Bessie. On the morning of November the 14th of 2012, Las Vegas man Robert Bessie was driving to work on Interstate 15 when he was shot in the neck by a gunman in a gold-colored SUV traveling in the lane directly adjacent to his. Although he was seriously injured in the ambush attack, Bessie ultimately survived. He later told the authorities that he'd recognized the vehicle used by the shooter as belonging to a woman who was in a relationship with his estranged wife's brother. Nevada police subsequently launched an investigation into the matter, which led to the discovery that the victim's wife, Amy Bessie, had personally orchestrated the attempted murder plot. According to court records, the 43-year-old woman had solicited the help of her son Michael and brother, an ex-convict named Richard Pearson, to carry out the shooting of her husband during his early morning commute. Upon the discovery of her direct involvement in the crime, Amy was arrested and charged with seven felony offenses, including conspiracy and attempted murder. During the trial that followed, prosecutors alleged that Amy had formulated the murder plot against her estranged spouse in order to recoup his $250,000 life insurance policy, which would have been inaccessible to her following the finalization of their divorce. In March of 2014, Amy was convicted on each of the seven counts levied against her and she was consequently sentenced to 14 to 44 years in state prison. Number two, 
Ryan Grantham. Canadian actor Ryan Grantham, best known for his appearance on the popular teen drama series Riverdale, surrendered to Vancouver authorities in March of 2020. The man willfully submitted himself to law enforcement after he'd fatally shot his mother in the back of the head, allegedly while she played the piano. The 24-year-old reportedly covered the dead woman's body with a bedsheet before surrounding her with rosaries and candles. It would later be revealed that Grantham had carried out the grisly matricide in order to save his mother from witnessing his plot to assassinate Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. He set the plan into motion immediately following the shooting. The authorities later detailed how the actor had packed his car with multiple guns, ammunition, and 12 Molotov cocktails before setting off for the Rideau Cottage, where Trudeau lived. Before his arrival at the Prime Minister's Ottawa residence, however, Grantham reportedly changed his mind about the murder plot. He briefly considered committing a mass shooting on the campus of Simon Fraser University, from which he'd previously dropped out. Grantham eventually decided to turn himself in before anyone else was harmed and he was subsequently charged with murder in connection to his mother's slaying. In March of 2022, Grantham pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, which carries a mandatory life sentence in Canada. Number 1. Barry Morphew Colorado woman Suzanne Morphew went missing after going on a bike ride near County Road 225 and West Highway 50 in Maysville on Mother's Day 2020. The Chaffee County Sheriff's Office organized a wide search following the May the 10th disappearance. An effort to track down the married mother of two included the execution of more than 135 search warrants across the state. The case experienced few notable developments for the better part of a year. Then in the spring of 2021, it was announced that the missing woman's husband, Barry, had been taken into police custody. Court documents indicated that the 53-year-old had been charged with first-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and attempting to influence a public servant, all in connection to his wife's disappearance and the ensuing investigation. Although the police weren't able to find Suzanne's body, her mountain bike and helmet were discovered on the side of a county road in Salida, near the family's residence. The case took a dramatic turn in April of 22 when prosecutors dropped all of the charges against Barry in an emotional interview with ABC News, he and his two daughters urged Colorado investigators to continue their efforts to find Suzanne's body so that the truth of what happened to her could finally be uncovered. Thanks for watching. Would you rather act on every thought you have for a week or lose the ability to see for three months? Let us know in the comments section below.